Hello, I'm Christina Zachary with the Zachary team forwarded by Phil's Running Company and today you are watching another one of our podcasts of Home Sweet Home live. Oh, hold on. We're actually not live. We're doing something different today, but we're super excited for you to be tuned in because today we have an absolutely amazing, wonderful guest. His name is Jason Glass. He's one of the top luxury agents here in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm so happy to be introducing him today because we know he's very busy. So Jason, thank you so much for being here. I know you're incredibly busy. And uh, introduce the introduce yourself to the world and say hi to you two. Absolutely. Well, Christina, it's my pleasure to be here. I was really excited uh, when y'all invited me uh, to be on this because I am really interested in podcasts and this technology. Yeah. And uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have now been doing this for 21 years. Okay. Uh, before that, I was an attorney and a marketing executive. I grew up in Dallas, but now um, I've lived in San Antonio longer than I ever lived in Dallas, and so oh. I consider this oh. my home. That's right. Love it. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. Uh, you grew up in Dallas. What made you decide to come to San Antonio? Tell us a little bit about the lawyer background as well. Yeah, so once I graduated high school, my mother and her husband decided they wanted out of Dallas. Yeah. They wanted to go to the Texas Hill Country. Do you so know why? They just wanted there's a lot of hill country in Dallas too. No, not really. It's really? actually, especially where they lived, it was pretty oh, flat. Right. It's pretty flat. And uh, they were just ready for a change. And so they spent about two years exploring the Texas Hill Country to find, you know, where they would want to live. And yeah. then they found a property that was being auctioned off in Bernie. It was actually mm -hmm. on Bernie Lake. And uh, so they were able to get that for a ridiculously low price okay. and so they went in they rehabbed that for quite a long time uh, but at that point my wife and I were living in Atlanta and but we didn't have kids we were thinking about starting a family and if we were going to do that we were really thinking about it, uh, about getting back to Texas where we grew up so the choices were Dallas where both my wife and I were from yeah Austin where we went to college or San Antonio where my mother was uh-huh we were pretty intrigued by San Antonio yeah. because it just had a different kind of vibe. It seemed authentic. It wasn't super fast paced. And we kind of liked that. Okay. Uh, Dallas, Atlanta, Austin, those cities are much more fast paced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that we just want to lay around and not do anything all day, but yeah. we kind of admired that about this city that it seemed to have tons of potential, already a pretty beautiful place to live. Right. But it had potential, and that was intriguing. So we decided to come here. And where were you? Were you a lawyer in Georgia, or were you here? Like, kind of. Really, only for one year. After law school, I tried to not be an attorney because when I was in uh -huh. law school, I really was pretty sure I did not want to practice. But I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Like you just had to finish it. Yeah, oh, I mean, okay. I was 22 when I started. Uh, so the idea was, okay, by the time you're 25, you'll be done with it. You'll have a degree that should be helpful no matter what you do. Right. I'd say that probably 30% 30, 30 of my class was the exact same way. Okay. And so I wanted to be maybe a sports agent or a sports executive working for a team or a league or something wow. like that. Uh, I ended up after law school getting a master's uh, in a sports management uh, master's program wow. at Ohio University, mm -hmm. which was great. They had a pipeline to Turner Broadcasting Company in uh, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So I got a job there and, you know, my first job there was working as a public relations executive for World Championship Wrestling. Which That's was, exciting. It was. It was <laughs> the best sales training I ever had because it was kind of scary. I would have to tell enormous men who were definitely on steroids <laughs> and who made millions of dollars a year yeah. and were on national television every week. I had to try to tell them what to do. So if I just said, Big egos. Yeah, yeah, huge egos. <laughs> okay, so Hulk Hogan, I need for you to please do this radio spot in Cleveland to promote our event there. Yeah. Brother, I don't do Cleveland. Okay, brother? <laughs> so, but I've got to get him to do this. So what's... The art of convincing. Yeah, so yeah. how do I do it? I, I figured out, well, Hulk, there's a Make-A-Wish child that really wants to meet you and they're able to come to the Cleveland show. And he would say, why didn't you just say so brother? I'm there, I'll do it. Mm. So you had to figure out, you know, what they would respond to. For many of them, as scary as they could be, they did care about the kids. Oh, I bet. And they wanted, you know, they were larger than life superheroes to those kids. So yes. I started to understand, 
I could overcome objections by then offering them something. Sometimes it was, you know, maybe someone that wasn't as famous that they would get on the cover of a magazine or they would get to do something that they had never mm -hmm. done before. And of course, that was very easy. They'd be really thrilled. Yeah. So this was a two-year uh, job for me. And yeah, it was a big burnout job. We ended up getting mm -hmm. sold to our competition that was Vince McMahon's WWE. Yeah. And so everybody lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a legal uh, job open at uh, CNN, which was part of the Turner family. And okay. so that's what I did for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. I reviewed all of their advertising, marketing, and promotions to make sure we weren't ripping off the elderly, specifically right. in Florida, mm -hmm. um, things like that. I'd review their television ads to make sure they weren't using someone's image without their permission, things like that. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty interesting for the first year, but then the second year, it was the exact same stuff. Mm -hmm. Literally, we're just gonna do this again. And I started to become pretty bored by that. Yeah. I wanted to be the marketing person. So instead of being the, the, you know, the legal handcuffs that, you know, the, the legal cop, mm -hmm. I would start saying, why are you using that color? You know, why are you doing this or that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, after a while, the marketing executives that were my clients, they would say, why are you, why are you, why do you care? You're the attorney. You just tell us if it's legal or not. Why do you care about the way it looks? Mm -hmm. I realized I wasn't going to make it too much longer. Yeah. <laughs> By then, my uh, my mother and husband, they had done some very successful home flipping mm -hmm. um, in the San Antonio area. They very much convinced my wife and I that if we would move here, okay. then uh, we could kind of jump into that with them. They would show us how to do it. And so, yeah, that's we came and we started doing some of that home flipping. I got my real estate license strictly to sell our flips, not mm. to work with any other clients. I'd say by about the second or maybe third project, we realized maybe I wasn't bringing that much to the table, mm. like with the design, with the remodel itself. <laughs> so it was like, hey, yeah. what's Jason going to do? Well, growing up, my mom was a realtor and a designer and my father was a real estate attorney. So I had these backgrounds. And mm. since I did go to law school, it was always like, well, do I really want to just go be a realtor? That, that does, it seems beneath my education level and all of this stuff. Mm. I resisted it. Well, once we kind of figured out that I needed to do something else, I needed to try. I walked into the Phyllis Browning company office. I met the office manager at that yeah. point. I met Phyllis herself and it was like, wow, this seems great, hmm. but maybe it's too good to be true, but let me at least try it. I'd say within 10 days, I was so excited and felt like this is what I should have been doing my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> However, if I had been doing it my whole life, I probably wouldn't have made it. Yeah. I needed those experiences exactly. to help bring me there. Uh huh. And yeah. so what year did you guys come, you and your wife come from Georgia to uh, San Antonio? That was uh, 2002. And okay. then in 2003, I got my real estate license. All right. So tell us about your first couple years. You said that first 10 days, you were super excited to be in real estate. And you're like, oh, wow, I should have been doing this a long time ago, which Gabriel and I feel the same way. Like, yep. man, if I started this when I was 18. Right. <laughs> but the, unfortunately, you see, you know, most people, if they're starting with their 18, they're, it's not going to work for them. You know, they might do a few, you know, that's more of like for it's their a tough own business. Thing. It is tough. And I think that you need a little emotional maturity, little experience, and mm. perhaps in different fields. And working with different types of personalities. Different types. I agree with that, 100%. So what areas did you, what did you kind of start with? Was it how, because I know two, Gabriel and I were four years into the business, so this is what we know, but we don't know what the market was like or what any real estate was yeah. like in 2002. So how was it being an agent in 2022? Yeah. Or 20, 2002? Well, the average sales price was, you know, I think around 180000 at okay. the time. The luxury market barely existed. Mm. There were, I believe, less than 50 home sales above a million dollars in the early 2000s. Yeah. It, it basically didn't exist. But I really did have an idea that I probably wouldn't make it if I was going to be a complete generalist. And what I mean by that is doing everything in every price range everywhere. Mm -hmm. I knew that that might be some good education, but mm -hmm. I was just worried that it wouldn't be a lasting strategy for me. So yeah. from the start, I did go in to the luxury business realizing that there aren't many to sell. Mm -hmm. But the aha moment for me was when I did the research, 
and I looked at what agents actually sold million dollar homes. There were like three of them mm -hmm. consistently. Phyllis was one of them. Yeah. Uh, my agent, uh, Deborah Janes, was another one of them. Mm -hmm. And then there was one other. And you know what I thought? I just thought, well, maybe I can bring something different to the table hmm. with the law background, with, you know, just being a little bit newer to the scene. Maybe people want a different alternative. Yeah. I wasn't 100% sure mm -hmm. um, if this would work, but I thought this is the way. And I didn't turn, I didn't turn my nose up at other opportunities. Right. So I did constant opportunity time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to learn. Okay. Like the way that I really appreciate that you guys, I think have reached out to some of the uh, agents that have been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to do. And the more I asked of my agents that were at Phyllis Browning that had been there for a while, the more I asked, the more they helped me. Mm -hmm. It was such an eye opener. I couldn't believe how helpful these people were. Yeah. Uh, I remember I was in the Broadway office and the agents that worked around there, they didn't really refer to houses by their addresses. They didn't say, Oh yeah. How much is one, two, three Jones street. They mm -hmm. would say, how much is the Chandler house? And I wouldn't, know who that was I wouldn't mm. understand and then I would finally figure out by asking that the Chandlers had lived in the house for 30 years but hadn't lived there in 20 years mm. okay but in that neighborhood it was like people knew who those people based. were yeah very relationship based I commented I commented this to this really really nice agent named Robert Marshall and he just said Jason you have a couple of hours and I said sure he goes well get in my car we're going to drive around the Alamo Heights area and I'm going to start you know pointing out like, why is the Chandler house called the Chandler house? Who are mm. these people? Why are they significant? Yeah. Very, very helpful. Very friendly. Um, so that was, you know, that was everything. So yeah. I absolutely, I would constantly be doing opportunity time, doing open houses and working with both buyers and sellers. Um, <clears throat> to me, that was a great education. But as far as targeting I went for certain neighborhoods that were on the high end side and I would just start sending postcards out and it would be, you know, realtor attorney, realtor attorney. Mm. And I was shocked that it worked very quickly. Yeah, it really did. Um, people wanted alternatives. Um, I was shocked in Alamo Heights that I was an outsider and I started to get hired like crazy in, in that mm. neighborhood because I was, I never would have known this, but cause I thought you only get hired if you're an insider Uh, -uh. in that neighborhood, people would have gone to school or church mm -hmm. with 20 different realtors mm -hmm. that they sometimes are friends with and close yeah. to. If they chose one of those 20, they would be in trouble with their mm -hmm. click. If they chose an outsider, they'd be in far less trouble. So I started to get hired by people that I had never met and they had never met me, mm. but they saw my advertising. They assumed because I was with Phyllis Browning and I had a law degree that I would be competent. Yeah. And so they would bring me in because I wasn't going to run into them at church or at Central Market. And that gave them a comfort level that I would handle their transactions with discretion and privacy. Okay. Wow. I'm really like <laughs> nice. So what, so when you were doing these postcards, did you back then, cause you had that whole thing with marketing and the colors, did you just go in and just do it by yourself or did you have someone design those postcards for you? Like at first where you were like that one man team or did you quickly try to add people to that team? Cause I know you have people on your team now. So right. what is that process Absolutely. like? Uh, so at that point, uh, the Phyllis Browning company marketing department, they pretty much had to design everything. Mm. Like you didn't really have the option to okay. do it yourself. So they would design it. I may have given some input or feedback because mm -hmm. I really did care about what it looked like and yeah. that type of thing. I had an idea of what that image should be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I would try to have a specific message for whatever neighborhood it was going out to. For about the first year, mm -hmm. it was just myself. Okay. okay. I didn't have a anyone that was helping me do the books or the paperwork or anything like that. Yeah. Um, after about a year and things were going well, mm -hmm. I really decided, okay, I can still keep up with this stuff, but I thought it would be a good investment yeah. to hire somebody. 
And I did hire somebody that did live in Alamo Heights who was extremely well known in that community. Mm -hmm. And I think that was good because she was, you know, she was very helpful and excellent. And then I did get to meet more people and I'm sure we got a few more uh, clients because of her. Yeah. Okay. So she did the job well, but she also had contacts that we could tap into Mm -hmm. as well. Um, So that lasted... I want to say for about a year, she Mm -hmm. had like an embroidery company and things like that. And, you know, had a, had a child. So at that point we were still on great terms, but she decided she wanted to take a step back. Mm, Okay. Um, I got a recommendation for another person who she was a politician's daughter Mm. and she, her family was extremely well known and I knew she was a graduate of Yale university. Uh, so she seemed like an impressive young woman. Mm -hmm. So we met and I really liked her. She was kind of quiet. Uh, she wasn't showy or flashy or anything like yeah. that. I'm like, great. I'm flashy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the loud one. She'll be the quiet one. Really liked her. The first listing appointment that I took her on, to me, it was such a standard appointment. Mm-hmm. The seller says, I think my house is worth $2 million. Mm-hmm. And I said, gosh, it's such a nice house, but I think it's only worth $1.7 million. We go back and forth. Mm-hmm. I don't think anything was decided, but it was just so normal. Yeah. And when we walk out, she just said, Jason... That was like one of those shows on TV. That was really scary to me. I, I, oh. It was so tense. And the way that y'all were arguing, and I just said, we, that was not an argument. We, we, just, we had slightly different positions that we each mm-hmm. believed in, and we each put it out there on the table for further discussion. So that was it. She, could, she said, this business is not for me. It's mm. too, too scary. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. Um, eventually, I got another referral uh, from a woman that worked at Phyllis Browning and it was to her best friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, that person, uh, turned out to be Elizabeth priest who worked for me as, uh, an admin at first. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly I saw that she could handle a lot more. So after a while she was admin plus buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. At one point, probably after about three, four years, I decided that I didn't really want to work with buyers. This was something that I picked up in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book by Gary Keller, where he basically makes the claim that in every single market in this country, the top producing agents are basically at least 75% towards listings. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that their team or they don't have a buyer's agent. They still do that business, but they personally are far more listing heavy. Yeah. And it really made sense to me. So even though it took a little risk, because I thought, am I going to lose business if I do this? I think it turned out wonderful because we did have our first child in 2003. I wanted to be, you know, around my kids. And then we had another one in 2006. So I wanted to be present. I wanted to be there. I felt, you know, one of the more time intensive parts of our business is driving buyers around, especially Mm -hmm. back then. Yes. Back then it was, it was more towards a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. If you could say anything, (laughs) Not a radical buyer's market, Mm -hmm. definitely not a seller's market. So sometimes you could, you could show 20 to 40 houses in a weekend, say out by SeaWorld or something. Mm -hmm. And they just say, yeah, mm, I don't know. Mm. So today I know that can still happen, but I think it's, it has been reset that buyers don't goof off as much as Mm. they used to. They know that if they're actually serious about buying a house, they probably need to get on it and it can't last forever. Right. Um, so Elizabeth was great at that, that, you know, so we became then basically a two person team. Mm -hmm. Uh, me as the team lead, her as the buyer's agent and admin. At some point, I think around 2010 or 11, we decided to add, a real admin person. So then Elizabeth could do both buyers and listings. Mm. Okay. Okay. So at some point she became a little more of a separate agent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of how that went. We had, we really had great success. I give her a ton of credit, Mm -hmm. Uh, hard worker, very, very smart person. And, uh, but starting when I hired her probably in 07, you know, she, she was a very young woman then probably 22 or 23 Mm -hmm. slowly, but surely she started building up her profile, Mm -hmm. her pipeline, um, and her sphere. And it became a really great one. Nice. Probably better than mine, honestly, in Mm -hmm. some ways. Um, so I'd say kind of for a while, we were a little more separate 
even though we're still a team. It's yeah. like we each kind of had our own business. We would talk every now yeah. and then. We'd collaborate, but a little more separate. I did have a goal, though, to have a much larger team mm -hmm. um, just because I was probably getting a little bored. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, I was in year, like, 16, and uh, I just wanted a bigger world. Mm. And so Elizabeth and I, we didn't, we weren't really on the same page about that. I totally respected her opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that she just preferred to be on her own. And she's, yeah. and so we, we um, parted ways mm -hmm. amicably and she has been excellent on her own. <clears throat> yeah. uh, I went and, you know, built up a team of five and uh, that was 2017. Uh, sorry, that was 2020. Mm -hmm. um, 2020 is uh, when I formed the team with five... Before COVID or during COVID? It was <laughs> just after. Oh, okay. August of 2020. It started mm. in March of 2020 is yeah. when COVID hit. Yes. So if you think about it, that was actually a good time for me to be thinking about what, right? I, want, what I want this to look like. Yes. What's my mission statement? What What's the culture? Mm -hmm. All those things. I really had a good amount of time to think okay. about. And then I'm thinking about who are those people yeah. that I already know. And, um, I had already met Kim Sweeney mm -hmm. and, uh, I just thought she was a superstar and, you know, asking her to be on the team and sh her accepting was like, wow, this is great. This is mm -hmm. amazing. And then there was an, another young woman who had been the manager for Tesla here, uh, when it was only on I-10. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, and she's like 26 years old and sure she looked 26 years old, but she acted like she was 56 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I love that about her. I'm like, mm -hmm. this, this woman is incredibly mature. So it was like, I knew she wanted to be an agent. She had already got her license. She had already been hired by Phyllis Browning. Yeah. But, um, uh, our manager at the time suggested maybe you find a team mm -hmm. and she didn't even know that Elizabeth and I had uh, split up our business. Mm. And so she came to me and she just said, Hey, I really admire Elizabeth priest. And I, I haven't met her ever, but I would love for my career to maybe follow her career. Mm -hmm. So I was like, great, but we're not together anymore. Yeah. Is that? And she's like, okay, okay. And I said, I've got the agents that I need. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to doing essentially a two year apprenticeship mm -hmm. where you are going to be the admin for this team. Yeah. You're going to learn everything about this business. I do believe you'll still get to do some real estate transactions where you'll get paid as a realtor, but mm -hmm. generally you're going to be admin. You're going to have a salary. Right. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to freak out about no sales and stuff like that. So she agreed. That was Lauren uh, Lampel, mm -hmm. and she's just been an awesome delight. So after two years, we went through with our agreement she replaced herself, and now she's an awesome agent on mm. our team. Slowly but surely, I started to learn about different people that I had either known from the past. For example, there's a great guy on our team named Bennett Kennedy. I knew Bennett because our kids, as infants, were in the same playgroup together. Yeah. But we used to live way north, almost in Bernie, where he lives. Mm -hmm. I really hadn't seen him for years. Uh -huh. While I was thinking about what agents do I want in this team... He called and said, you know, after COVID, I started to think about doing something different with my life. And do you think real estate would be a good career for me? And mm. I just said, yes, but I want you to come work for me. Because even though he didn't have his license yet, yeah, I just knew he was going to be you great know. at it. I don't, you know, I, I think that you don't need a lot of experience hmm. to be good. It can help. But to me, life experience... Um, Dealing with different people. Relationship skills. Relationship yep. skills, being able to talk to Rapport. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he had all of that. So I was really excited. Yeah. And so this guy named Todd Warwick, he was an attorney mm -hmm. that came to me probably four years before the team and said, I want to do what you did. I want to switch from being an attorney to being a realtor. I probably get 10 of those calls a year. Mm -hmm. And when I tell the attorney, yeah. Hey, we can sit down and talk. I'd love that. But real quick, how would you feel about taking an entire weekend and showing 40 houses by SeaWorld <laughs> and you just either see the light go out of their eyes or you hear it in their voice? They're not up for it. They're mm. not up for that kind of <laughs> uh, 
hustle and hard work. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll say, by the way, mm. just know now at cocktail parties, if you say, oh, I'm a realtor, no one, no one's going to want to talk to you. <laughs> no one's going to bow down and kiss your feet and assume you're intelligent like uh. they may have. And what you found out, a lot of these attorneys, the only thing they did like about their job was being able to tell people they're an attorney <laughs> and that people might think they're smart or special. Taking that away and knowing that they're going to have to work hard. Right. They're not going to yeah. be able to just automatically start selling million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. It made most of them just go away and they never got into it. Todd was totally different. Mm. He's like, I want to do anything. I want to learn. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do a lot of investment properties ourselves. And so I said, great. I wanted him to prove it. I actually sent him to another major national brokerage to get trained on oh, nice. like everything. Everything. Today, honestly, Phyllis Browning Company could do the exact same thing and better. But, you know, mm. probably seven, eight years ago, we didn't have all the training systems that are in place today. Right. Okay, so I have a, so my biggest takeaway from that is, of course, San Antonio is a huge relationship based city. And I think that real estate, just in general, is a relationship based industry. So it really helps to have those two just kind of co align and coexist together. Now, when it comes to relationships, obviously, Gabe and I are a husband and wife team, but how was your relationship during that time? I know that real estate can get super busy. And like you said, sometimes we're dealing with buyers and listers and there's so much going on and it's such a loud industry. How did y'all work together in order to, to, to make it? Are you talking about husband and wife or team? Husband and wife. Yeah. Yeah. Well, y'all are a team. Yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it is, it can be difficult and, or, and also, I guess, what advice do you have for other couples? Because I know a lot more couples are coming. And not that y'all were like a husband and wife couple realtors, but I think a lot of people don't understand the real estate industry is busy. So when they have a, a wife or husband, yeah, honey, go, go do your thing. It can be distracting or they're not ready for it. I think it can be helpful if your spouse is in the business because then you don't have to do work explaining to them about, you know, I've got to go do this at eight o'clock at night or, you know, this is the only time they can go or weekends, etc. cetera. Um, obviously in my wife, she mm -hmm. just knew, especially at the start that there would be a few sacrifices yeah. like that, but it was worth it to build it up. Yeah. And so, and then after a while by hiring Elizabeth and then eventually others, it did free up my time where mm. I have never, I've never had to miss one of my kids games, events, anything. Mm. That was my template that I That's wanted to follow. Why. That is my why mm. is that I didn't want to look back after, you know, mm. they went to college or something like that and say, gosh, I have so much regret about the time I didn't spend with them. Mm. So that's where I use leverage other people yes. to help me free up that time. So as a top agent now, cause I actually just started Tom Ferry coaching and they say that Top agents like yourself have, I think, eight, seven to nine lead generations. Is that how many you have by yourself, or do you include those lead generations with your team? How does Ferry define lead generations? Would it be different spheres? Is that what he's talking about? Like di different types of getting leads or clients, like networking, sphere mm -hmm. of influence, yep. uh, social media, Great question. cold calling, Great all question. of that. Because there's so uh, many options out I there. I have never counted them up. I can tell you some of mine off the top of my head. Go ahead. Um, and I think hopefully this is inspiring for those that maybe don't have big sphere of influences already yeah. or they're new to the city, which is I didn't know anyone except my mom. She didn't really know anybody. Mm -hmm. So really my first connection was Phyllis Browning Company, which at that time, I think there were only about 60 agents, okay. only two offices. Everybody kind of knew everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I think, the second or third youngest agent out of those 60 at the time. Wow. So it skewed a little older. Uh, and I found those, you know, those agents to be helpful. So think about this as a sphere that nobody would think about. Mm. I get a call from an older agent that had been doing this already 20 years mm -hmm. and they're at a different stage of their career. And I had just met them. I had been friendly and professional with them. I introduced myself to them, which they weren't even used to. Yeah. And it would be <laughs> like, Oh, Hey Jason, this is Jennifer. Um, I sold my clients a house in the Dominion five years ago and they want to sell. 
I live in Alamo Heights. I don't want to go out there. Can I just give it to you and give you give me a referral? Mm. Oh, oh, okay. Twenty mm. percent referral, and this this was a one point two million dollar house mm. that I sold, and then leveraged it into other sales. Yeah. So I do tell newer agents, especially at our firm. Yeah. I'm not ever guaranteeing anything like that will happen, but would it ever hurt to go meet mm. the agents that have been doing it the longest and that have a long track record of success mm -hmm. to say, Hey, if I can ever help you out, I just want to introduce myself mm -hmm. because today the company is much bigger and uh, there's many more uh, newcomers. And uh, yeah. sometimes I think there's a little bit of split Mm -hmm. between the older agents, those of us that have been doing it a long time, mm -hmm. and the newer agents. Yeah. So I tell those newer agents, it's on you to introduce yourself, to say hello, and I still believe in that. Yeah. That, you know, that can lead to things down the road because some of these agents, they're not, they're, their why is definitely not money. Mm -hmm. Their why may be taking care of people. Their, their why may be that they want to enjoy, you know, their yeah. last three to four decades in life, whatever mm -hmm. that is. And so to them, it's worth it to give up, you know, 75% of the money if someone else will just do it for them yeah. and they know they're well taken care of. Yeah. What advice would do you have for newer agents? So like, let's put, <clears throat> let's say you are 23 right now and you were like, Hey, I want to be an agent. You are yourself, but you're, let's rewind back 23, but you're 20, a 23 year old agent in 2024. What would you do? I know you said leverage. So I think you would go to, you know, the, the, um, veteran agents, but what else would you do right now as a new agent? Sure. Uh, in a sense, I want to convey this, that they should be everywhere all of the time. Okay. Just had an agent on my team. She went to her daughter's volleyball game. She met a woman who was a grandmother of one of the other girls who was playing. And somehow she's like, Oh, I heard you're a realtor. Um, there's this house that I saw online and it's really interesting to me. You think you could show it to me? The answer was yes. They just put it in her contract. It's a $3 million property. Wow. That's because she went to her daughter's volleyball game. So that's unusual. Yeah. <laughs> that but doesn't happen all the time. The only thing that's unusual, though, is the price range. Yeah. Okay? But if you go to events, if you're out, if you become known, if you strike up conversations, if you're more of an introvert, I would say... I was about to add that. Yeah. yeah if you're more of an introvert, and some of the best agents I know by the way, are introverts. Mm. I'm not, but many, yeah. many are. And I feel that the only challenge for them is to, you know, uh, appropriately, you know, break out of the shell. And I understand that being an introvert does not mean that you're mm -hmm. not a people person. Oh, no. Yeah. It just means that maybe your ener energy gets more depleted and, you know, bigger, bigger rooms and things like that. Mm -hmm. I do have situations like that too, so I can understand it. Yeah. But getting over it by realizing, okay, this is part of the job. It's part yeah. of the work. And sometimes in work, we have to do things we don't love. Yeah. Okay. So even for people, but I find highly analytic people that aren't big talkers, they can be really good at this job. Yeah. I try to be highly analytic and I am a big talker as well. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because there's so many facets to this job that if someone doesn't want to do social media, they don't have to. There's plenty of other opportunities out there in order to um niche on that like you said you wanted to become just like hey i just really want to handle listings that's what i'm going to focus on and i think there's this myth of top agents and i would love for you to speak on that is like oh those top agents they all the phone their phones just ring and they have to do nothing for work so when of course a time when that whole nar settlement comes out and there's an adjustments in the industry or covid um, as a top agent, how do you feel about that myth from younger agents or that, that thought? I think it is, I'll say it is partially mm -hmm. true. Once that you have been successful in this business and mm -hmm. you don't stop doing things that made you successful, such as a robust marketing program, yeah, it's almost like you cannot stop it. So at this time... It's like a machine. Yeah, so okay. at this time... It's like the, the ads that I did three, four years ago, mm -hmm. they're still effective to get business from people I don't know today. Mm -hmm. So especially in the spring, every week, I'll probably get two to four calls from people that I haven't met. We don't know each other, but they've seen my ads mm -hmm. many times for a very, very long time. Okay. And so they didn't have a reason to call me before, 
but now they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that once you get it rolling, Mm -hmm. it, it is hard to make it stop unless you proactively kill it, Yeah, which some people do by just flat out leaving the business or, you know, quitting the business or, you know, just moving to another market or something like that. But to me that I think it's important. Mm -hmm. It's not that you have to reinvent the wheel every single year and keep you know, just right. go like once you've done it for a certain amount of time, I can't tell you exactly how long that is. It would just be guessing. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, you did enough. And now it's going to roll. It's going to keep effect. rolling for me, for my first, gosh, probably seven, eight years, probably 80 to 90% of my clients were strangers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I didn't have a sphere as my first child started to get older and there would be things like play groups and mm-hmm. uh, preschool and yeah, things like sports that. sports and all that. Yeah. yeah, and then I saw that my, my wife could start becoming a little bit of a effective mouthpiece for yeah. my business as well. <laughs> where, mm-hmm. and, you know, she's, she's way better than me. And, you know, so it's like people really like her. Mm-hmm. And so after a while, they would be like, oh, I talked to so-and-so, you know, we yeah. were playing Bunko or something like that. And yeah, they mentioned, and so, yeah, she'd like to talk to you. So she started helping, and then every year that the kids got older and mm-hmm. went up a grade level in mm-hmm. school and then changed schools, I started to get a lot of business from their schools. Mm. And, you know, we did put them in private school. That was, it was like, this is going to cost money, mm-hmm. but I can tell you that it has paid for itself so many times over Yeah, from people that also have their kids at that school hiring me only because they know me from that school. Mm. So to me, that was very much worth it. I mean, could you make the same argument that, you know, a big public school, if you're involved, yeah, you could, Yeah, you could for my specific, um, luxury market though. That was definitely a place where people who were selling those houses were also having their kids in school. Okay. Now, I've been going on Facebook lately and Gabriel and I are part of some groups and there's a ton of posts of not just newer agents, but also veteran agents and agents like in the middle of that that have been in the business for like seven, eight, nine years. A lot of people are struggling right now because of a whole bunch of reasons, right? What advice would you give to, to them while they're currently struggling? It would be, how do you add specific value? I do think with the NAR settlement, there may be a Mm reimagining of commissions. Now, we know there has never been a standard set commission. There never has been. It was always Always able to be negotiated. However, Mm -hmm. I would say that it was a little bit of a strange business in that newcomers and people that maybe weren't good at the job often would charge the same thing that I was charging. And that Mm. other top producers were charging. You wouldn't see that in the legal field. You wouldn't see it in medicine. You wouldn't Mm. see it in accounting. You would see those that had been in it the longest and were the most successful charged more than beginners. Mm -hmm. So I would say for some, it needs to be looked at about, okay, if I want to get in the door, do I need to, you know, make my commission a little bit less? I am not afraid of this for anybody because Mm -hmm. I believe in fairness So I believe what I charge is fair Mm -hmm. and I believe everybody has that fair spot and it shouldn't necessarily be the same for everybody what that spot is. Okay. Okay. For some people, four and a half would be incredibly fair. Others it's six. Mm -hmm. Others it could be even more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that really figuring out what's your value and you know, frankly, with the interest rates, you know, where everybody got used to two and a half to three and a half. And then, you know, they've been mid sixes for a while and they were even higher last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It has, I think, taken a lot of affordability out. Yeah. So now the price ranges in between, you know, a hundred and maybe 700, it can be a little trickier Mm -hmm. or people are in their houses right now at an amazing interest rate. And they don't want to trade it in for a higher one. So what, what value do you bring? And I would suggest if you do the exact same thing, everybody Mm -hmm. else does, it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you continue honing your skills and you really focus in on, 
maybe you just, you don't do everything because that's what everybody and their dog is trying to do. Instead, you'd say, this is my niche. This Mm -hmm. is what I'm really good at. Is it a certain area of town? Is it a certain neighborhood? I really do give this advice. Target three neighborhoods Mm -hmm. that you would love to work in. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to be the neighborhoods I love to work in. Not at all. Mm -hmm. That might be, it could be a price range. It could be neighborhoods that are zoned to where your kids go to school. Mm -hmm. It could be neighborhoods that are also near where you live. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, there's all these different spheres that Mm. you could think about. I think a good brainstorming Mm -hmm. session for a few hours could unleash some of these things where you're like, wait, you know, my kid, it loves baseball. Should I have a ad on the outfield wall at the little league? Mm -hmm. You know, because I think that whatever you're into, whatever your passions are, you should think about how could that fit? That positive energy will come back. Positive energy, Mm -hmm. but also strategically what you're into are there spheres that would also be into it? Okay. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, pickleball, which is something that I've started playing now for three years because yeah. you know, it, it is fun. Mm-hmm. It's social. Guess what? It's also, it's a pretty high end group generally. Yeah. And so I've gotten clients from pickleball, which it's not the reason I do it, but it's something I love. Mm-hmm. And once you do it for a while, you start to get to know people. And, you know, you don't have to wear a name tag and say, look, I'm a realtor. After a while, it naturally happens. Mm -hmm. So I guarantee you, everybody has their things, you know, where it's physical, mental. You could be in a chess club. You know, there's all these different cooking classes. But realtors that are, you know, either struggling or they're just getting started, they need to be really out there, really prolific, signing up for everything and not necessarily things that cost money. Yeah. There's plenty of things that don't cost money or they don't cost much. Yeah. You know, you, you got pets, take them to the dog park. Yeah. You know, when you, these type of, I mean, this is a little more, <laughs> make sure we have time. Are we good on time? Yes, you're good right now. Okay. Got about 10 more minutes, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I got a big part of my career. I got going because there was this restaurant bar that was outside of the Dominion neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Thursday nights were a huge deal. This okay. was called the Grill at Leon Springs. Mm. And um, yes. it was fun. And since we were kind of new, it was always fun to meet new people. Yeah. I never thought of it as, okay, I'm going to go in there and strategically start talking about real estate so somebody will hire me. Not at all. Yeah. I just thought, I'm going to be here. I'm going to It's like commission fun. breath, you know? I love that. Yeah. Great term. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's huge. It's, yes. to me, the soft sell is so much more impactful than that desperation do this you know trying to bully them so but this one night Mm -hmm. my wife and I were in the bar area and this attractive young woman walks past us and she just kind of waves at me and says hi Jason and my wife looks at me who's that and I just said Mm. I I truthfully (laughs) have no idea (laughs) I am not lying to you I have no clue who that is. So she comes back from the bathroom. She walks past her table. She goes and sits with this other woman. I see them starting to whisper to each other. They start laughing. They both come over. Mm. And they're like, this was so weird. But she goes, I thought you were her husband, who is my boss. She was a nanny for this couple in the Dominion. Oh. And the guy's <laughs> name was Jason. Oh. <laughs> and, and and the wife was like, yeah, you do look like my husband. It's a, <laughs> and so we all sit down. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had a nice old time, exchange numbers. Within a few months, that couple splits, and they mm. want someone to sell their house in the Dominion. Mm. So I did that, and then I actually helped sell them, uh, get them into their next purchase. Yeah. And then, unfortunately, they had quite a few friends who went down the same path, and I sold their houses, too. Mm. Being at that bar, that one night, yeah. I can't even tell you how many tens of millions in business it ended up giving me. Wow. This is not a, a advice to go be a bar fly all the time. Yeah. But just strategically, selectively, there. mm-hmm. um, there's a woman at our company who she does want to work in the Dominion. And so I told her the story I just told you. And I said, and there's, and she goes, well, I don't want to go by myself and everything. And I said, look, there's some nice places that are, you know, right across the highway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you go there, just have a drink at happy hour. It's not going to be weird or sleazy. I promise you. She did it. She got a client immediately from it. Wow. She told me. So she was like, thank you so much. 
all of these things are just being out there. Yes. So whatever that means to you, I really think it's important, especially right now. Okay. Wow. Perfect. This is amazing. So I have one more question and cause you like, I think of other questions. I'm like, Oh, he just answered that. Oh, you just answered that. So I want to know, uh, your future, like you're very successful right now. Do you, what, do you have any new plans coming Where do you see yourself in the next five years and, and 10 years? And do you plan on growing your team or do you plan on expanding? What's your, what's your plan for the next few years? Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Mm -hmm. I am throwing more of my energy today into the team than just my personal business. Okay. That's giving me incredible satisfaction because they're all thriving mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, truthfully, they've never let me down. They've all exceeded my very high expectations. So they give me a lot of delight. So I want to keep pouring into them, you know, my knowledge opportunities. Since I don't work with buyers, they get all of my buyer leads and mm -hmm. they handle them beautifully. Uh, I do have one uh, agent on the team, Annalise Bosquez. She's in our Austin mm -hmm. office. So I want to continue to help her grow her presence in Austin uh, I do have some ideas that I might get agents in our other major Texas cities. I'm going to talk to a woman in Houston this weekend mm -hmm. uh, who I've known for quite a long time. Uh, of course, I'll need to convince her that, yeah. you know, why would you go with a San Antonio based uh, brokerage when you're in Houston? Yeah. I have some things I think can be helpful. And then I, since I grew up in Dallas, I thought, well, why don't I try to do that as well? Mm. Add someone there. And then I think eventually it would, you know, the team doesn't get massive, but it gets a little bit bigger and maybe we have them in four cities in our state mm. and just kind of see how that goes. I think, uh, my last kid at home will be in college next year mm -hmm. and I definitely want to be able to travel, travel, visit them. So, you know, there's probably a little bit less of me just really grinding out my own mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and letting the team you know, probably Prosper. do a little bit more and they're more than capable of handling it. Of okay. course, I'm still going to be around. <laughs> yeah. I'm always there to answer questions for any of their clients, any of you know my teammates questions. Uh, I really enjoy that. I enjoy being helpful, probably even more than selling. Mm -hmm. Now, have you ever thought about with your kind of attorney background as well? Have you ever thought of uh, diversifying and going into commercial real estate? It's a, it's a really interesting question. It's something that I have thought about mm -hmm. and I wondered if I, I didn't handle it well. I tend to be a person that when I see something work, I just want to stay in that lane. Okay. I don't want to deviate. And yeah. so I felt like I got something good going with high end listings mm -hmm. in certain parts of the San Antonio area. And I kept that incredibly narrow focused. So farm and ranch, commercial investment, <laughs> Forget it. I always referred those out, but now mm. I have people on the team who do it as well. I feel like I'm a little bit crazy mm -hmm. in that I love the emotional part of our business. Residential real estate, yes. it's like often pure emotion. It is. And <laughs> I think really sane people, it doesn't make them feel great to yeah. be the sponge <laughs> that absorbs all those feelings, Yeah. but I happen to like it and I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think going into commercial, which is much more business yeah. focused. And yes, yes, it's, it's far less emotion. It just has never interested me. I want to oh, get okay. in there and say, not only are we going to sell your house for this amazing price, but you are going to be so okay afterwards. You're going to feel great. This is a new start on life. I love that stuff. And I think it's a little crazy, but it does keep me in a very narrow lane. I mm. don't encourage other people to necessarily stay in that lane. I encourage people to get different specialties yeah. if they're willing to put the time in it. And if it interests them, if it, they'll... Right, that's yeah. the key. Don't do it just because you think you're supposed to. Yeah. Do it if it interests you. So uh, we do still have 10 minutes left, actually, so get real set. I have an interesting question. Um, of course, in real estate, uh, there's never there's never really a transaction where it's just the smoothest because things pop up on the buyer side and the seller side sometimes. So what is the biggest horror story that you have and what did you learn from it? You don't have to name names. We never no. do. <laughs> All right, Christina, there's, there's, there's quite a few really interesting ones. Um, but what, or like one of the most impactful or like oh, it's just... It, well, I can just tell you that 
we learned very early on that mm -hmm. the luxury listings attract frauds. Mm. So. I bet. I ha And we were aware of this and mm -hmm. we were aware, Phyllis actually taught me about how do you pre-qualify these buyers without offending them. And I thought, you know, I just thought she, she, she freed me up to feel mm -hmm. like if I ask in the right way and they don't want to do it, they're not for real anyway. You don't need to worry right. about that. If they throw a tantrum about being asked to show that they've got it, mm -hmm. they're not for real because these people understand that proving that they have it is part of the process. process. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this one, I had a friend in the business who will remain nameless mm -hmm. and she said, you know, I want to show this, I think it was a two and a half or $3 million listing in mm -hmm. Barney. And, but here's the thing. This is so weird, but you know, the husband doesn't want you there. Oh, okay. okay. And she was like, I don't want to tell you why. I'm like, this is just weird. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, and then she's like, finally, okay. Promise you won't tell anybody, but his money is because he's been cast as the lead in the sequel to the movie 300, mm. which is this huge action movie in yes. the early 2000s. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm big into entertainment. I'm a fan of that movie. Mm hmm can you at least give me the guy's name so I can look him up? So I looked him up. Mm -hmm. and this guy had zero acting background. It appeared that he was like five foot one. Mm. And I was like, what? That's so weird. Well, yeah. I, I let him do it. I think I sent Elizabeth in, in my place. Uh, he claimed that we were buddies from like a poker game or something like that. <laughs> Okay. And that it was just so awkward because he didn't use me as his agent. So this wasn't true. Yeah. But I was just kind of like, all right, let's roll with it. Well, Elizabeth did a lot more digging and, you know, while she was there, kind of figured out the guy was like a total fraud. Mm. And uh, he ended up stealing an Escalade from a Cadillac dealer here because he had tricked them oh as well. Oh, my gosh. And there was like a hot pursuit. He totaled it. He went to jail for years for fraud. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And we've honestly, we've seen some real sketchy situations, mm -hmm. you know, where we kind of outed somebody, a guy that was scamming a woman online. That's a big thing in luxury real estate. Sorry, guys, but it's always the guys who are scamming the girls, tricking them mm -hmm. that they have more money than they do, lying mm -hmm. about it with an online flirtation and then at some point the woman says hey i finally want to come meet you i'm coming to san antonio well that guy is desperate to prove that he's actually got it so he's going to try to book appointments mm. at luxury homes and take them to the ferrari dealership um so we did have to shut that down quite a few times and it makes those people get very angry and occasionally leave messages that they're going to kill you wow death threats threats yeah you know, I haven't had that in a very long time, mm. thankfully. But, yeah, I'd say that was it. Just this weirdness of mm. why are we here? What are we doing? Um, you know, so we've gotten a really good handle on preventing the frauds from even showing up today. But in the past, that was it. Yeah. I even think uh, just female realtors, their safety is super important today. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Do you have any – have you guys had any – I know that y'all seem or have you heard of any stories of that with, with women, female realtors and how would you, like as a male realtor, do y'all deal with that by yeah. chance? Um, first of all, for women, it's a hundred percent certainty that they must be overly cautious. Yeah. Not saying appropriately cautious, overly, overly. Mm -hmm. no risks, no chances. You've got Gabriel, you have, there's just no reason if you had any fear whatsoever mm -hmm. that you should take the appointment, there's ways such as having that person meet you at the office and yeah. saying, yeah, our office license, requires license, license dr driver's license, the mm. sketchy bad buyers, they're going to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, especially with lying and other things, they can get some realtors very excited that there might be a huge commission at the end mm -hmm. of this and that might make them compromise <laughs> what their rules are yeah. and my advice is just don't do it don't do it and hey i'd say men need to be smart too because yeah it's not it's not always you know gonna be a, a sexual assault 
Mm-hmm. No, it could just be a robbery. Mm-hmm. I mean, that has happened to men as well. Yeah. So, Better safe than sorry. Yeah, always. Well, let's end on a positive note. <laughs> just kind of like, ooh, be down there. Um, one more piece of just different advice for realtors or for buyers or sellers out there. What's something that has been on your minds lately? You're like, man, I really wish I talked about that more, said that more to people. Is there anything on your minds that you just want to kind of get out there to the YouTube world? Yeah, let me think real quick about that. Um, <laughs> you know, the most important thing, uh-huh. if you're going to be a successful realtor, is to be resilient. Hmm. You could say to have thick skin. Yeah. Uh, I can just tell you that before I got into real estate, I didn't have that quality. Hmm. I kind of knew I didn't, but I always thought, well, but I've got so many options. So if something doesn't go just perfectly, I can quit, start over, do something new. Well, when we moved here mm-hmm. and then I got out of that home flipping deal, okay, I felt like I didn't have the options anymore. Hmm. And because of that, when something unpleasant or unexpected or disappointing happened, it just wasn't in my brain that I could quit. Hmm. It wasn't. And that made all the difference. So it didn't hurt anymore. It didn't wow. hurt. And, you know, everybody, if you're good at this business Mm -hmm. and you're in it a long time, you're going to have disappointment. Yeah. So in a way, that proves that you've been good at this. Yeah. (laughs) If you're in it for a long time, guess what? Your client's kids are going to get their real estate license and replace you. Mm -hmm. That's nothing to be sad about. It means you've been in it long enough for that to be possible. Pass the torch, yeah. Pass the torch, okay? So, um, you know, to me, just if... You know, you're in your 20s and your 30s, you know, just always be more of a listener than a talker, Mm. really for any age, if you're going to be a realtor. Having appropriate questions, but then just sitting back and listen. Listening to the pain points. Yeah, you may have heard before when I'm on a listing after our home tour, I just say, how can I help you? Yeah. Such a vague, broad question. It's a strong question. But I think it's strong because it gets them going down paths that they may have not considered it allows you to just listen mm-hmm. and note, you know, specific things that, you know, you've learned from that. Yeah. So asking broad based questions where you just get them, get them rolling, get them talking. Yeah. Um, I will say this and, and signing off, this is a business where the mo- more honest and ethical you are, the better you will do. Mm. I know that may sound surprising for people's general uh, consensus about the real estate industry. <laughs> Maybe it's true. If it's true, that just means the more ethical and honest you are, the more you're going to stand out. Yeah. It, I don't think That's there's any, and never lie. The best answer to a question that you don't know is I don't know, but I'll find out. I'll find out for you. So many newbies, it just, it's so scary. It makes them feel so insecure and scared yeah. to get a question that they don't know the answer to that they lie or they'll mm-hmm. guess. I don't know the answer to many, many things to this day. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to know everything. Yeah, because it's always a changing industry too. So I don't know, but I'll find out. And then you find out and you follow up. That is gold. Yeah. That's That's your big win right there. People love that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jason. Couple more things. Um, our next guest for our podcast in May, his name is Lewis. He's actually our accountant and he's... He's amazing. What leave us a question to ask him for the next podcast? Uh, if it's in his wheelhouse, I would, you know, ask him, you know, what legal status corporations he knows about to mm-hmm. save realtors taxes. Oh, is it an S corp? Is it? And he may just say, the "Thing is, I would think he's." He, so to me, that could be a business attorney that mm-hmm. needs to do that. But I'd be shocked if Lewis hadn't encountered these mm-hmm. issues. Yeah. Okay, good question. And we are so happy to have you on our podcast. I'm, before we do the outro, I want to give you something. So every single podcast that we have, I give the gift guess our guests a gift um i like we were talking about earlier i'm a yellow fun personality i love all things creative so there's a few paintings in and around our office that i've done so i create a canvas specifically special for our clients so i have one for you that's so sweet and here you go i make it out of crayons or wax or melted wax this is beautiful and for you i tried to put a lot of metallics in it (laughs) 
<laughs> so do whatever you like I with love it. it. Thank You're you. You're really talented. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much again for being on our podcast. We truly, truly appreciate it. And if you can, uh, look into the camera and uh, just say goodbye and how they can reach you if they have any questions and talk a little bit about yourself. Take it away, Jason. All right. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to be on this awesome podcast. And if you ever want to reach me, my cell phone number is 210-386-1833 or check out our website at jasonglast.com. Dot com. Thank y'all so much. Have a great day. <laughs> and thank y'all for watching another one of our podcasts. As always, we are Gabriel and Christina, San Antonio's realtor couple. So if you have any questions about buying, selling, or investing, uh, you can reach us at 210-504-5301 or get in touch with Jason. He's an amazing agent as well, as y'all can tell. Uh, leave comments below if you have any other questions and subscribe, subscribe, sub, subscribe. Hit the bell notification button and we will see you guys on the next one. Thank you so much. Have a great day and bye. Bye. <laughs>